Well, good morning and welcome to St. Francis on this second Sunday after Epiphany. We're continuing to work our way through Paul's letter to the Romans, and this morning we're at chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. And so I invite you to turn there with me now, and while you're turning there, let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning with our Bibles open before us, praying that you would send us your Spirit to illumine the page for us, that your Word might dwell in our hearts, that it might come alive to us, that we would become more and more like your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Stefan Kishko was a 23-year-old tax clerk in West Yorkshire in England. He lived with his mom. In fact, he had no friends, no social life at all beyond his mom and his aunt. He was a lumbering, good-natured child in a man's body. He was the butt of jokes as a kid in school. Testing later in life showed that he had the mental and emotional age of just 12. Well, a few days before Christmas in 1975, Stefan's world came crashing down around him. He was arrested as a suspect in the murder and molestation of 11-year-old Leslie Molseed. After three days of intensive questioning, he confessed to the crime. You see, he thought that by telling the coppers what they wanted to hear, they would let him go home. Prior to 1984 in England, suspects didn't have the right to have a solicitor present during interviews. Well, at trial, he was quickly convicted and condemned to life in prison. And for a person convicted of sexually molesting and killing a child, life in prison was and is hard. He was often beaten by the other prisoners, and his mental health descended into delusion and schizophrenia. Now, so that I can bring this sad story to an end, I'll skip all of the details, and I'll jump ahead to the end. You see, after serving 16 years in prison, Stefan Kishko was completely exonerated and released as an innocent man. He needed nine months of rehabilitation before he could go home to his mother. In his compensation for his 16 years in prison, he received 500,000 pounds. But his physical and mental health had been destroyed, and he died 18 months after being released age 41. You know, I thought about this story all week. Here is a completely innocent man sentenced to a life of condemnation, yet here we sit, all of us, guilty. We're dead in our sin and we deserve condemnation. But something miraculous and wonderful has happened, something so incredible that we should rejoice and give thanks every day and yet we take it for granted. Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set us free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Imagine now, if you can, how Stefan Kishko felt the day that he was exonerated and walked out of that prison a free man. See, that's how we should feel every day of our lives because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. To be in Christ, as Paul says, is to be swept up in the power of the Spirit to be free from what binds us. To be in Christ isn't the result of something that we do. It's something God does for us. Paul doesn't tell us to straighten up and fly right so that will eventually be able to become in Christ. He tells us in verse 9 that we're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. This is good news. And the question for all of us is this. Are we living our lives as if we believe this? To believe it is to completely, completely rely on the power that's much greater than this. 
It's to have our lives completely changed by a power that's greater than any power we know in this world. Now, death is probably the greatest power that we know in this world. In the end, it conquers all of us and everyone we know. But the power of death isn't just at the moment that we take our last breath. It's a power that can creep into our lives long before we kick the proverbial bucket. Ask any alcoholic about the power of death, and if he could step back away from the disease and tell you how it has affected his life, he will tell you all about the living death that he and his family have endured. Ask the parent of a child uh, of a child who is addicted to drugs, and you will hear of the power of death to break a heart even before that kiddo dies. But even this power is not enough when compared to the power of the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. Verse 11. To be in Christ is to proclaim, in the words of T.S. Eliot, the vanished power of of the usual reign. I'll say that again. To be in Christ is to proclaim the vanished power of the usual reign. See, all things are made new. And I, and I know it's never that simple. The oldest passed away, still tries to grab at us and pull us back, and we sometimes find ourselves torn between the old and the new. This struggle between spirit and flesh is at the very heart of the passage this morning. Now, check to see if I miss counting. Not right now, but when you get a chance. But in these first 11 verses of chapter 8, Paul refers to the flesh, or the body, 12 times, and to the spirit, 11 times. Now, the flesh can be described as our fallen condition, our focus on the self rather than on God. It's rebellion against God, idolatry or worship of things that are not God. Flesh also includes what Paul describes in Romans 7 as our inability to do the right thing or what we want to do. As Paul puts it, I don't understand my own actions, for I don't do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Money financial security, youth, health, work, good looks, technology, even sometimes church, are just a few of the things that we can sometimes worship instead of God. Now, spirit is arguably the most important word in these verses. It's not something that we dreamed up like the spirit of Christmas or the spirit of brotherly love, but it's God's Holy Spirit given to Jesus' followers after his resurrection to guide them and to comfort them. It's what Jesus' followers receive when they're baptized into Jesus' death and resurrected through the waters of baptism. This is the spirit that dwells in the heart of those who are in Christ and keeps their minds on the things of God and life rather than the ways of death. This spirit is our assurance of God's promises. This spirit will give us, as we face up to the challenge, challenges of this life, will guide us, excuse me. This spirit will give us peace, even on the darkest of days. There's a battle being waged between the law of the spirit of life and the law of sin and death. And the assurance we have, as this battle rages on, is that there is no condemnation in Christ. It doesn't say no mistakes or no failures or even no sin. To be sure, we, we do suffer the consequences of our sins, but we don't suffer eternal condemnation. Speaking of condemnation, Ole went to the doctor because he was feeling a little sick. and After a few tests, the doctor told Ole, he says, I'm sorry to tell you, that you have a rare disease, it's incurable, and you're going to die in six months. But to help you out, I'm going to prescribe that you move in with your mother-in-law. Oli replied, 
Cry me, Lee, that's bad, Doc. But why should I move in with me mother-in-law? Doc said, because that will be the longest six months of your life. All right, seriously. It's the law that condemns. But we have a new relationship to the law, and therefore we can't be condemned. Verse 2, the law cannot claim us. We've been made free from the law of sin and death, and we now have life in the Spirit. Verse 3, the law can't condemn us. Christ has already suffered that condemnation on the cross. The law cannot save. It can only condemn. But God sent his son to save us and do what the law could never do. Verse 4, the law cannot control us. As believers, we live righteous lives, not in the power of the law, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. The law doesn't have the power to produce holiness. It can only reveal and condemn sin. sin. But the indwelling Holy Spirit enables us to walk in obedience to God's will. The righteousness that God demands in his law is fulfilled in us through the Spirit's power. We're declared righteous because we are in Christ and for no other reason. The legalist tries to obey God in his own strength and he fails to measure up to the righteousness that God requires time and time again. But spirit-led Christians, as we yield to the Lord, experience the sanctifying work of the Spirit in our lives. The evidence of conversion is the presence of the Holy Spirit within, witnessing that we are children of God. Our bodies become the very temple of the Holy Spirit. And even though our bodies are destined to die because of sin, the Spirit gives life to our bodies today so that we may serve God. When we die, our bodies will one day be raised from the dead because the Holy Spirit has sealed each of us. We are marked as Christ's own by the power of the Holy Spirit working within us. And what a difference that makes. Life is no longer the same. When evangelist Dwight Moody described uh, his conversion experience, he said, I was in a new world. The next morning the sun shone brighter and the birds sang sweeter. The old elms raised, waved their branches for joy. And all nature was at peace. Life in Christ is abundant life. It's a life free from condemnation, free from the law of sin and death. That's good news. and We should rejoice to claim it. Or you could just go live with your mother-in-law. Now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be all dominion, power, and glory forever and ever. Amen.